So uh, today I'm here to uh, talk about uh, learning deeply at scale, uh, the challenge of our times. Uh, so this comes out of a uh, five-year research project that my uh, doctoral colleague at the Ed School, Sarah Fine, and I have been conduct conducting. A uh, study of ambitious instruction, uh, instruction which is rigorous, challenging, and engaging uh, in American high schools. Uh, we uh, did essentially a sort of tour, a national tour of uh, American high schools, uh, comprehensive schools, public schools, charter schools, those no excuses schools you read about in the paper, uh, project-based schools, schools that do international baccalaureate, schools that do a AP, uh, schools that are rich, poor, uh, et cetera. Um, to just sort of uh, get a sense, um, as Judy said, in a sort of broad sense of sort of what, what does instruction in high schools look like, uh, where is it better, uh, what could we do about it? Um, we oversampled schools serving poor and working class students, but this is a book about schools as a whole. There are a lot of middle class uh, affluent schools in our book and in our writing. Uh, our methods were mainly uh, to observe and to talk to people. We spent a lot of time in classes and meetings uh, on fields, in theaters, uh, and we interviewed uh, a lot of folks. And there is a book, thanks in no part to all the time I had at Radcliffe this year, uh, coming out on this next year. Okay. So uh, just uh, provisionally, I'm um, going to be talking about deeper learning. So let me just give you this definition from Hewlett. Uh, the Hewlett Foundation put forward a big stream of money around deeper learning. Uh, of course, he who has the gold makes the rules and gets to name a uh, sort of new version of the golden rule. Uh, and uh, they say that deeper learning entails mastering core academic content, critical thinking and problem solving, collaboration, and self-directed learning. Uh, less formally, I would just think of it as being able to sort of see beyond the surface of an issue and being able to understand its deeper uh, roots. So we're going to talk a lot more about this. I just wanted to give you a definition just to get started. Okay. So uh, why should we care about this? Uh, the most often cited reason is economic, that uh, 50 years ago you could graduate with a mediocre high school education, get a job at the factory down the road if you were a white man. Uh, and that would uh, lead to a decent middle class income with which you could buy a house where you could put your two and a half kids and uh, reproduce to the next generation. That's obviously no longer uh, possible. If you asked employers in 1970 what the top skills they wanted, they would say reading, writing, and arithmetic. If you ask them today, they say things like uh, teamwork, problem spotting instead of problem solving, like can you identify problems? So uh, the economy, the uh, requirements of the economy have increased. Uh, second reason is equity. So to the degree that this learning already exists, it's mostly existed in elite publics and in privates. Uh, uh, the lab school in Chicago, the school Dewey founded at one point, their slogan was 21st century skills since the 19th century. Uh, so uh, it, what I'm talking about is not exactly new, but the demand for uh, lots of people to be able to do it is new. And in particular, the idea that uh, all students, particularly students of color and high poverty students, would have access to this is new. Um, and if that doesn't convince you, there's always this sort of societal rationale. Uh, I first made this slide uh, before the election, arguing that uh, people's ability to be discerning in their choice of political candidates and uh, being able to read statistics, decipher evidence, penetrate real news and fake news was really important. And nothing since the election has shaken me of the importance of that uh, view. Um, my dad, as my dad said to me once, like, you think that you're sort of trying to solve poverty and mobility, but like, really, like, the fate of the country is at stake. Uh, and I, I, th I think that there's some truth to that. Um, and then the last point is just uh, interpersonal contexts are also uh, very complicated. Uh, I pulled this photo from the internet, looks like a nice uh, Latino family who knows what dark secrets are lurking below the surface. Uh, I'll just give one example. Uh, in my house, uh, my older son is uh, six, and I wanted him to pick up uh, stuff when he messes things up. And in my mind, this was sort of a Kantian duty, like if you, you know, if you create the problem, you should fix the problem. And I tried to explain to him that living in a communal society meant that you had to take <laughs> your part and so on. And then I went to work, and I came home, and things were picked up. And I said, what happened? And he said, oh, uh, Grandma, his mother-in-law, uh, paid me uh, <laughs> in, uh, in dollars. Uh, and I thought, oh. Uh, and my wife and my uh, mother-in-law does some portion of our childcare. And my wife just looked at me, and she's like, don't rock the boat. 
Uh, uh, so, I, you know, as Judy said, I have, you know, several advanced degrees and have spent a lot of time thinking. And it, it really took every ounce of all of that thinking and ability to manage, you know, emotions to try to figure out sort of how to navigate the situation, which might be uh, familiar uh, to some of you. All right, so uh, the challenge is there. Uh, and the question is, you know, could schools do their part? Not, not all this, you know, a lot of things you learn for life you're going to learn outside of school. But, like, could school do... Uh, its part in helping uh, equip us. Uh, so that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, what does it mean to understand something deeply? How do you teach for deeper learning? Why are these experiences relatively rare in American schools? And what would it take to build a system that would more consistently support uh, good uh, experiences? Uh, and the teaching part, while I'm talking about high schools, a lot of it might be relevant to university teaching. So there may be things for those of you who teach at that level that might be useful to you. Definitely doing this project has helped me revise some of the things that I do in my own uh, teaching. OK. Oh, and I should also say that this is going to be an interactive talk, because there's no way I can talk about deeper learning and just stand here and lecture at you for 45 minutes. So uh, just be prepared that you're going to do a little bit of uh, mental work. Um, OK, so uh, what does it mean to understand something deeply? Uh, let's think about this uh, together a little bit. OK, so uh, this is a cell. Um, you may remember this from middle school or high school biology. Uh, how many people in here have sort of significant experience with biology? Um, all right, so more than in a public audience, but still most of us, uh, this doesn't look too familiar, myself included. Um, okay, so you don't need to know a lot about biology to play. If you, if you don't you know, remember all the parts of the cell, you can just sort of make it up. Um, for the moment, for the moment. Uh, I'm going to talk about why that's a bad idea in schools in a little bit. Um, all right, so um, here's what I want you to do. So uh, imagine that you were a teacher, and imagine that you were trying to design a deep lesson around the cell. Anybody can do a deep lesson around you know, oral history of the civil rights movement. Like it's the material just writes itself. But uh, let's say that you needed to do it around uh, this uh, cell. You wanted students to sort of understand some uh, key aspects. Uh, of the cell. Um, so just uh, take a minute or two uh, and then confer with uh, a person or two around you and uh, try to tell each other like what you would do if you were trying to uh, sort of teach deeply about this uh, cell. Okay, go for it. <laughs> All right. Okay. So uh, who, who has an idea? Let's start first with the folks who don't uh, like do biology for a living uh, or don't have just, just uh, folks who are just treating this sort of from a lay perspective. Uh, give us an idea. Um, go for it. Um, make a story out of it. Say, what is the cell trying to do? And how are these parts going to help do it? And also, my brother was a biology professor. And if he had a diagram on this, he did not get a hand up. He put it on, on the board, and they had to copy it into the notebooks. And he said, it's going to be better that way. All right, so there were two ideas there. One, uh, if they copied it, they would remember it. And two, uh, if they needed to know something about what the cell did, that would help them make sense of it. OK? Our idea was to um, have groups of them each sort of, if you think about it as a system, each person remove a piece of the system and mm -hmm. then play out what would happen if you did that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why? Uh, like, tell us more about why you had on that uh, idea. Because it would help them understand how each piece functioned within the cell. Mm -hmm. And in, a, in every case, each piece is necessary. So if you take one out, the cell will likely die, but in a different way. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, other ideas, go ahead. Uh, there's one word that uh, occurs twice, and that's membrane. So uh, I think it must be important. <laughs> it's it must be important. I think it was that, yeah. uh, for keeping in it as a barrier, keeping uh -huh. out some That's things, cool. letting uh -huh. other things go in, both to the cell as a whole and the other place it occurs is in, around the nucleus. And I have no idea why. Uh -huh. Uh, what's special about the nucleus? Yeah. It has to be the nucleus. But membrane obviously has to have its own membrane. Huh. 
So that's interesting, right? Even without you know, detailed biological knowledge, you can reason just from the, what's written on the slides, right? You can start to understand something about the functions just by noticing that two of the things share the same term and thus must be playing the same uh, role. OK, uh, one more. Stephanie, go ahead. Um, I was thinking it, that you were talking about the possibility of showing the cell under some sort of duress, so the cell affected by some kind of disease, infection, would the functioning mm -hmm. be different? Would the story be mm -hmm. different? So sort of the Garfinkel ethnomethodological ethno approach, like if you put it under stress, you'll get some sense of why it works and why it doesn't work. All right. Uh, so uh, those, are, those are great ideas. And the reason that uh, they're great ideas, and a number of you hit on them, is that they don't just ask you to think about what the parts are. They ask you to think about how the, how the system uh, functions. Uh, and another way that you could do it is you could ask them to um, make an analogy. So say to sort of create a city and have the city sort of serve out, have the parts of the city do the same functions of the cell. And if you can transfer the principles of what's happening in the cell to another context, that sh demonstrates that you understand uh, how they work. All right. Um, OK, good. Um, oh, and I should say that this is uh, too cultured an audience. Sometimes people say things like, um, you know, well, what if you just made every kid, like, gave every kid a role and, like, one dressed up as the nucleus and one dressed up and so <laughs> forth? And they're like, you know, it would be really engaging. Uh, and it, w it might be engaging, depending on how you uh, pitched it, but it, it wouldn't get at the, at the function. Okay. Uh, so about uh, a sixth of us are biologists. Uh, how many people have listened to Car Talk? Aha. Uh, okay, all right, this is my kind of crowd. Okay, so if you, um, I think what the car talk really brings it home, right? So when uh, someone calls car talk and they say, you know, my thing is my car like sputters every 50 feet and then it shuts down and, you know, it makes these sounds, er, er, er. and then the guys are like, you know, does that happen more when it rains? Like there you see someone who understands the system, symptoms talking to someone who understands the underlying system. And so the questions are from a diagnostic point of view from the perspective of someone who understands the system. OK. Um, so the, um, so um, OK. So this is sort of the, the cognitive side of deeper learning. It connects to research on expertise, pattern recognition. Uh, and one uh, way of looking at the sort of cognitive side of deeper learning in the classroom is to use a very old tool, Bloom's Revised Taxonomy, which was created in the 50s, and anyone who's taught is familiar with this. Uh, basically uh, distinguishes six levels of classroom uh, tasks, remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. Um, and so when we went into classrooms, just very simply, we just said, what are the kids doing and which level across these things, are they, what are they being asked to do? So if they're, if they're copying something from the board, they're remembering and maybe potentially understanding. For example, if they're applying an algorithm in math, so they've been given the algorithm, they're working out the problems that's applying, and then analyzing, evaluating, and creating is more sophisticated. Um, so the Gates uh, Measures of Effective Teaching Study uh, classified tasks this way. This is the largest ever study of um, videotape study of classrooms in the United States, and they found that about uh, four in five classrooms were in this bottom half, and about one in five classrooms were in this uh, top half, and that was pretty consistent with our experience going into classrooms. Another way to put it is, if I stapled myself to a kid and followed that kid through their day, we would likely hit upon one and sometimes two classrooms where teachers were asking students to think, to put it in really simple uh, simple terms. Uh, there were sort of good news and bad news in our study in that uh, a number of the schools that we went to were recommended schools. So someone said, you know, if you really want to understand deeper learning, 21st century skills, go to this school. And uh, the bad news was that in those schools, there was often much less than met the eye. What was on the website far outran what was actually happening in the classroom. The good news was just at regular public schools down the street, this sort of one in five pattern uh, prevailed. So I gave a talk once somewhere, and I was talking about one in five, and I was put, putting it out there as a sort of fairly pessimistic number. Uh, and someone came up to me afterwards and said, you know, if there's three and a half million teachers in America and 700,000 of them are doing this, then you have a really you know, large group of people who are already doing the things that you want, and like, couldn't you build on that? And so uh, that was interesting. 
OK. Um, so then the second part is the sort of affective dimension, right? Which is like, why would anyone want to learn about the cell in the first place? Like those of us who are my age or sort of sandwich generation folks who have parents and aunts and uncles who are getting older, all of a sudden like biology is sort of becoming a lot more interesting because people are getting sick in a variety of ways and sort of understanding how the body can break down seems a lot more relevant than it did even a few years ago, say for me. Um, so the question is sort of, you know, what's the purpose uh, of the learning. And so the other thing that we looked for in classrooms was uh, engagement, which is, you know, were kids watching the clock, waiting for the class to end? Were they uh, sort of uh, full-throated, involved in whatever was happening? Uh, and so here's a quote from a teacher about her best classrooms. This was actually at one of these like really strict, no excuses schools. And we said, so like what happens on your best day? And she says, I mean, there's just a feeling, kind of a buzz or a sense of investment and engagement. It's really hard to quantify that and describe it because it's kind of an aura that fills the room. So I feel like my best day is when everyone is not just focused because I think our kids are always focused because they have to be focused, <laughs> but invested in what they're learning, that there's something motivating them beyond just that they have to do this. They're experiencing a level of intellectual engagement, even if English is not their favorite subject or one that they feel particularly good at, but they feel the lesson is exciting and worthy of their mental space. Uh, so all of us have taught and all of us have had classes that have taken off and all of us have had classes that fall flat. Uh, so there's no world where every class is going to soar. But the question is, like, could you create the elements that would make them soar more often? Um, and can you get to the center of the Venn diagram? All right, so here's some uh, national data from the student Gallup poll on engagement. This is actually a composite of a number of more specific indicators uh, that measure uh, engagement in school. And uh, fifth graders, about 75%, uh, say that they, so self-report, 75% say that they're engaged in school, and by 12th grade, it's down to about 32%. Uh, and you have to be in school to take this poll. So all the kids who are dropped out are not represented in this uh, sample, and presumably the most disengaged kids aren't there. So the real numbers are actually uh, worse. Uh, and I would, I would uh, challenge you to think about engagement not as a sort of frilly side effect, like, oh, they're out of the lessons, they're bored, like, oh, the lessons always say they're bored, but to think of it more like a precondition for learning, that until you engage in a subject, you can't really, uh, you can't really take it up. So um, long story short, our tour of schools convinced us that, there's a, that there are sort of two big challenges facing American schooling. One is about the level of challenge, and the other is about the level of engagement. Uh, and if we could make some progress on those two things, uh, our students would have, there would be much less sort of wasted potential in schools and we would have much more capable uh, adults. All right. Um, so just to sort of illustrate this, I uh, just wanted to talk about two classes from an affluent public high school in New England. Uh, this is a picture of Wayland Public High School. That wasn't the school in our study, but like it just gives you a sense. This is not a school where, you know, there are um, you know, where everything's breaking down, where there's no money, where the teachers have no experience level. Like, this is a, the kind of place where you would pay money for a house to send your kids uh, to this uh, school. Uh, and so the, the kind of the average class, okay, so again, this is not a disastrous class. This is not kids uh, as a book on schools opens with kids, like, peeing into the plant in the classroom. Like, it's not, it's not like that, you know? This is just sort of normal uh, school. Okay, so the teacher standing in front of the class, the AP psychology class, reviewing for an upcoming unit test on different types of conditioning. What is over justification, she asks. And Eliza says, people do things when they expect to get the reward. What is food aversion, she asks. Adam says, if you eat something that makes you feel sick, you won't want to eat it. She reminds them of an acronym that Mr. Chin, another psychology teacher, came up with. Voice, voluntary, operant, involuntary, classical. But it's a bad acronym because the E doesn't stand for anything, she says. <laughs> the kids laugh. She gives them a few minutes in small groups to talk about the terms they aren't sure about. She passes out an open note quiz. The questions are pretty similar, like what is stimulus response? They go through the answers. She asks students to volunteer the answers. She says, you know, Connie, what did you get on this? And Connie says, A, and she says, no, that wouldn't be the best choice. And she turns to someone else, and they say, B, and she says, yes, that, that is correct. And after that, she gives them some advice about what the AP is looking for on their sort of short answers, and then class is dismissed. So this is kind of average, not terrible, uh, you know, not incompetently managed, but just sort of average. Uh, and then compare this to another class in the same uh, school. Um, 
So uh, philosophy is literature class. This is an elective class, which is important, and that students had chosen to take this class. Uh, and when I come in, they're sitting in a sort of semicircle, and they're discussing uh, Descartes. And they're discussing this idea about uh, is that we, is the fact that we um, know, how do we know what we know? Does the fact that um, I could think that everything out here, you all could be a dream, this podium could be a dream, these chairs could be a dream, but the fact that I'm thinking it means that I exist, right? And so they're sort of unpacking this idea from uh, Descartes. Uh, the students are doing most of the talking. Mike is interjecting things occasionally. And then the students are saying things like, what about computers? Like, computers seem to think, but do they exist in the same sense that humans? Or what about vegetables, like humans as vegetables? Like, they can't think, but don't they exist? And so the class just sort of went around like this, like pondering different examples and counterexamples and trying to think about what would Descartes have made of that, what would they have made of Descartes. And then towards the end, uh, the teacher tries to do this sort of teacherly thing of saying, all right, well, tomorrow, like, we're going to talk about how uh, Descartes, uh, Descartes' views on God and like, why God must exist. And the students are like, wait, 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 wait. Like, how would he know that? And what's the logic? And where is it coming from? And he's just trying to wrap up the class. But once you sort of let out uh, skepticism, you can't uh, bottle it uh, back up. Uh, one of the students in that, that class told us that he had tried to explain what Descartes thought about free will to his carpool. Uh, so like, that, that's kind of how it went. And so part of the question is, like, how could we, like, what, what's different about these two classes, and how could we generate more of the second and less of the first? Um, and as we started to look across these teachers, we, we noticed some uh, differences uh, between most teachers and what we might call these sort of deeper learning teachers. Uh, the first point was just the goal, that the goal of most teachers was to cover the material. And the goal of these teachers, if you really sort of put a point on it, they were trying to basically inspire people to become members of a field. They knew that understanding Descartes would take a long time, many years of study. But the, what they were just trying to do was just get kids to begin the practice of arguing and thinking in philosophical uh, terms. Because of that, their pedagogical priorities focused on depth as opposed to breadth. Their view of knowledge was uh, uncertain rather than certain, right? That knowledge, uh, even disciplinary knowledge, is essentially provisional. It's some, an interpretation connect, created by a group of scholars and verified through certain conventions. Uh, and they were inviting students into that, and they were uh, essentially sort of helping students play with that. You could see that again in the Descartes example. Like what, what, they, what the students did is a sort of rudimentary version of what philosophers would do around the same uh, question. Uh, changed the role of student from a receiver of knowledge to a creator of knowledge. They had a different view of failure, not as something to be avoided, but as something to be embraced. Uh, and these classes had a different ethos less compliance, more what I call purpose uh, plus play. OK. So what differentiated these uh, people? A big part of it was their stance. So they had a different view of what it is they were trying to do. Um, a second part was their knowledge. They were uh, deeply knowledgeable about their fields and thus were not afraid of venturing into places where they might not know the answer. They welcomed students saying things that they hadn't thought of, and that came from a certain security with the content. They developed pedagogical skill in a particular mode. The mode might vary. In Mike's case, it was sort of leading a Socratic seminar. In another case, it might be project-based. In a third case, it might be competency-based. The university level, it might be case teaching. It, the mode didn't matter, but they had developed enough sophistication with the mode that they sort of knew how to use it. Uh, and then critically, they'd had experiences of what it was they were trying to create. So whether those experiences had happened in their own K-12 schooling, in higher ed, or somewhere along the way as teachers, they'd sort of become convinced that the way that people normally do education wasn't really serving their students well and that they wanted to do uh, something different. There was one woman uh, in our study uh, who taught a fabulous theory of knowledge philosophy class where the student said, this class makes my brain hurt every day. Uh, and I said, where did you learn to teach like that? And she's like, oh, well, the first time I started teaching was on a Fulbright in Indonesia. And like October of the first year, this student came up to me and tapped me on the shoulder and said, you seem like a really nice lady, but you've got to stop talking. 
Uh, <laughs> and uh, she just sort of saw that as a sort of signal moment, which had started. She was probably 45 when I talked to her, but like this had started a long uh, journey. Most of the teachers who uh, are in our sort of deeper teacher sample were over 35. Like it took a while to, to get to this uh, place. Um, okay, so I want to switch gears for a second, um, and I want to think a little bit about how do people become deeply knowledgeable about something? Uh, because you might think that how people become knowledgeable or skilled at something should inform how we think about what happens in schools. Call me crazy. Uh, so um, just uh, think of a domain could be a professional domain, could be a hobby, could be cooking, could be whatever it might be, uh, where you know someone could come to you and they could ask you a question and they could ask you a follow-up question and you would feel comfortable like having a really uh, significant conversation about it. Okay, you got something like that in mind? All right. Uh, and now try to think a little bit about uh, how you came to reach that level of uh, skill or expertise? Were there signal events? Did it happen in formal schooling, outside of schooling, et cetera? OK. So uh, just uh, turn to a neighbor and take a couple minutes and uh, exchange uh, stories. We've got about four minutes, so take about two minutes, and then uh, swap. Go for it. All right. All right, great. One of the perils of student-centered teaching is that people never want to return to the person up front. Uh, OK, so uh, who has a story that they want to share with us? Um, go for it. My question is, can we ever be knowledgeable <laughs> or skilled? Uh -huh. Given that there is a saying that says, I know one thing that I know nothing. And yeah. I was just telling my neighbor that, yes, I studied something, I learned things, but then the thing itself develops. And as time goes by, I find myself genuinely Interesting. <laughs> knowing less. Interesting. All right, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's pick that up at the questions. That seems like <laughs> we can make a little bit. <laughs> What's that? Re re repose that as a question when we get to the, the questions. Uh, anybody have a story they want to share? Just, or would they be willing to let me talk with you for a minute or two about your skill? Kristen. So mine is uh, vegetarian cooking. Vegetarian cooking, OK. Uh, how, was, um, how did that start? Like, where so you? I started that my, I became a vegetarian in high school, and my family was like, well, you're going to cook your own thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, you know, realizing that I didn't know anything about protein or anything like that, it took me a long time. And so I read a lot of magazines and books and, you know, just practiced a lot. Mm -hmm. Trial and error. Made lots of terrible meals. Uh -huh. you know, <laughs> ate a lot of salads until I couldn't eat salads anymore. Uh -huh. And really learned to cook more through that. What, uh, what motivated you to become a vegetarian? Um, my she knew she will meet me. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> We're really sitting in the right spot today. I had, you know, I had an older sister who had gone to college and become a radical feminist and a vegetarian. And uh, so she sent me the book, The Sexual Politics of Meat. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It feels good on her. Yeah. And I think it was a sort of shared opposition to like politics. Thanksgiving with our family to be like, we're not eating. <laughs> uh, is there any uh, community in your story? Did you ever find other people who knew how to do it? Yeah, and I think that you know I've gotten better by like I was just saying I really like to cook with other people, like um, particularly other like vegetarians or vegans, and so I feel like that's something that I do together a lot and learning different kinds of techniques and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, does anybody have a second story which is sort of different, not just in subject but in kind somehow? Uh, Nick? Uh, I, uh, I'm a master strength chess player. Uh -huh. And uh, I got strong by playing a tournament to get beaten. And I, didn't and I didn't like it one bit. <laughs> so I work hard and when the next tournament I try and uh, mm -hmm. I try to be better and often I did and then you go up a level and I get beaten again. Hmm. All right. Anybody have an example of something that's not so much a skill, but a, you know, a development, a way of thinking, a way of being? So my mom is an education 
degree holder, and when we were growing up, and I'm the oldest in my family, she would often talk about why she was parenting in certain ways because of what kids do at that developmental stage, or explain what she was doing as she was doing it. And I think she also was a reader of a great deal of fiction, so there was always kind of a third person omniscient narrator going on in my house. <laughs> but it made me clear of the why of dealing with kids, mm. and it made me more willing to then, as I got older and was babysitting and then being other roles with kids and eventually parenting, asking other people who I saw having really good relationships with kids, where kids would have a lot of fun and learn a lot, mm. why are you doing that? Mm. Or what, what makes you do that? Well, that's interesting. So it's sort of normally when there's parenting, there's just the parent and the kid. In this case, there was the parent and the kid, and there was this sort of body of thinking about parenting that was in the conversation between the three of you, and that sort of sparked an interest, and as you became a parent, especially, or a child taker, caretaker, you continued to, okay. All right, so uh, I would love to continue to do this, uh, but we'll, we, maybe we can return to it uh, in the questions. Um, so we think that there's a sort of a model that sort of roughly captures some of the kinds of things that you all said. Uh, it has three elements, kind of mastery, identity, and creativity. So mastery is developing uh, knowledge and skill in a domain. So in chess, that would be you know, learning the openings. And, um, and then there's uh, an identity dimension. It comes to matter to you. We heard that in Kristen's example of the sexual politics of uh, meat. Uh, and then there's a creativity example where you're not just taking in things, you're trying to do things. And how well you do those things, we heard this in Nick's example, when you, particularly when you're unable to do the things that you wish that you could do, that pushes you back towards the sort of more basic parts of study, which is the sort of mastery uh, part. Uh, Benjamin Bloom, the same guy who came up with Bloom's taxonomy, did a study of swimmers, uh, Olympians and other national swimmers, and he sort of asked them and their parents like how they'd gotten to be that way. And they said, well, when we were four, we just liked the water. Like we liked to play in the pool and at the beach, like the water was our thing. And then uh, we got some coaching from our kind of local Y and so on and so forth. And somewhere between eight and 12, there was a shift. We went from uh, we're people who swims, I'm someone who swims, to I'm a swimmer. Uh, and then when that identity shift happened, that motivated a lot of practice. So this is all that stuff you hear about, uh, you know, discipline, practice, repetition, all that. There was a lot of that between about 12 and 20. The coaching got more sophisticated. So they went from the Y to the state to the national. So they were getting sort of more and better uh, feedback. And then they said at the end they could play again, just at a much more sophisticated level than they could uh, before. So you might think of these sort of cycles of mastery and identity and creativity as like a spiral, that over time you do this in communities, and over time each community sort of shapes you, including Radcliffe. Uh, and the attributes of that community sort of move you, and where you are in your journey when you hit that community affects what uh, you take of it. OK. Um, all right. So um, to tie this to bring this back towards uh, schools. Uh, where are there opportunities for deeper learning in American schools? Uh, and so we say we sort of have three big observations from our study. One, in all schools, opportunities for deeper learning were present but relatively rare. Uh, two, they were on, on, the opportunities that were there were unequally distributed by race, class, and track. And three, that peripheral spaces, including electives and extracurriculars, were often more promising platforms for this kind of learning than disciplinary classes. So in the remainder of my time, I want to talk a little bit about each of those three points. All right. So uh, the first point is that the uh, grammar of schooling, which is a term uh, uh, developed by my colleagues uh, David uh, Tyak and Larry Cuban, uh, to describe the sort of aspects of schooling that are so baked into schooling that we don't even really think about them being there, but have really uh, significant impacts in what happens with respect to learning. So I was particularly interested in high schools. Uh, in most of the high schools I went to, kids were taking seven things for 45 to 50 minutes each. Teachers said that basically it took a few minutes to get going. About the point where people were starting to get interested in things, you had to shut it down if people were going to wrap up their papers and move on to the next thing. Kids said they were trying to do homework in seven things each night. Uh, and so if you were trying to design opportunities for people to do things in depth, there, you wouldn't do it that way. Uh, the second point is uh, breadth, breadth over depth. Um, the state standards and the district pacing guides emphasized 
must cover this thing that Newton did, this thing that Darwin found, this play that Shakespeare wrote, et cetera, et cetera, and that the march of content and the pace made it hard to go into depth. Um, the core task for students in school is to record what other people have thought about things and reflect that back. They have a lot of practice at that. They do not have a lot of practice at creating knowledge or thinking about where knowledge comes from, which is why I think that often they're doing what we might think of as facsimiles of disciplinary work rather than actual disciplinary work. So in science, for example, when you do a lab, you're essentially following a series of steps to show to yourself a principle that somebody else has already discovered. And if the lab doesn't show that, then like you did something wrong, like something went wrong in your lab. Whereas science, as everybody in this room knows, is basically the opposite of that. You're not showing yourself the known, you're exploring the unknown. Um, uh, there's little connection to the outside world, and students did few things that didn't just go to teachers and come back. So uh, the grammar was sort of not promising. All right. Um, a second point, um, so I just want to tell you about a day we spent at a, um, a traditional public school in the Bronx. This was a high poverty school uh, and had all of the problems you might associate with uh, a high poverty school. Um, and my colleague and I, Sarah, uh, spent the morning at this school, and uh, I went to a history class, and it was uh, one of the, it was literally like one of the worst classes we saw in our whole uh, study. The students were sitting in rows, the teacher was saying, and then the Industrial Revolution happened in, and the kids were supposed to say 1900, 1880, like that. Uh, and uh, the, um, uh, and so that was my morning. I came to lunch rather dejected. Uh, my colleague Sarah, with whom I've done a lot of work, uh, also saw uh, history classes in this same school. And uh, she, uh, in the classes that she saw, kids were examining primary documents, developing interpretations, giving each other feedback on each other's interpretations. Like, you know, they were doing a sort of 11th grade version of history. And so we come to lunch and we're reporting our various mornings. And we're sitting in this conference room, and this woman walks in, and we realize that we've seen the same woman teach, just in different tracks. Uh, and she said, we talked to her, and she said, well, I tried to do this stuff with these kids last year, and it didn't really take, and they need to pass the regents, and for regents, they need to know when the Industrial Revolution is, so this year, I'm, I'm doing it this way. So there's a big gap in the field when it comes to uh, knowledge of how to uh, um, interest and engage uh, students who are not in the top tracks in uh, this kind of uh, work. Um, we tend to sort of blame the people, but I would sort of tend to sort of blame the field. Like the, the, they, they have ways of working in certain contexts, but they don't know how to work in other contexts. There were some people in our study who did it with uh, students who are not in the top track, so that, and there's lots of people in other people's studies that have done that, so it's not that it's not possible, it's just that uh, the knowledge of how to do that is not widely available. There's also a belief gap, like uh, students in, teachers in uh, more affluent settings had much higher beliefs about what their students could do, and that um, shared racial and class backgrounds in those schools sort of treated, had them treat students as sort of capable meaning makers. Uh, the famous line about this is, you know, upper middle class students are being prepared to manage factories, and poor and working class students are being taught to work in factories. And, uh, that's a very old line of the literature, but it's still true. Um, okay, so um, basically we saw different kinds of challenges to deeper learning in across these different uh, contexts. So I've talked about the challenges uh, for the poor and the lower track students, but I want to take a minute to talk about the challenges in the middle and the upper track classes. So uh, in the AP track classes among students who are trying to get into uh, top and selective colleges, there was a sort of different kind of problem, which was um, scholars in education have distinguished between what they call performance and learning orientations. Performance, some of you may know this because it's sort of filtered into the higher ed, how we should be teaching literature. But uh, performance orientations emphasize getting the right answer. Learning orientations emphasize productive struggle, exploring, 
um, making mistakes, et cetera. And students, particularly students who wanted to, who lived in affluent communities and wanted to go to top colleges, like they were not having any of this learning orientation. <laughs> like they wanted to, they wanted to know that they were going to get the good grade. They wanted to know that they were going to get the AP. The teachers were in turn evaluated by the parents on the grades, by the community on the number of APs the kids passed. And so all of this uh, mitigated against uh, more powerful learning. And these communities, teachers frequently said, you know, we do a lot of the interesting stuff, like basically from now, this point in the year, like May 15th to June 15th, because that's after the APs uh, are over. Um, this is a pretty complicated issue because AP is a way to create some standardization across a lot of schools. And so the same teacher said, like, I, well, I think AP might be a good thing in another district where they didn't have as high expectations as we had here. Uh, um, but anyway, this performance versus learning orientation thing was a big problem. Uh, I'm, this is a talk which is covering a lot of ground. So AP is a complicated subject. There's variance across the APs. History is the worst uh, in terms of depth versus breadth. Other subjects, they've made some changes. We can talk about that in the uh, discussion. Okay. Then there was this question of the periphery and the core. So when we started the study, we were focused on classes. That's what people at ed schools do. They study English, math, biology. Um, and as we went to the schools, we thought, came to think, like, this isn't really where the action is. Like, the places where kids are building skills, where they're engaged, where they're making mistakes, look more like those spaces around the edge, choir, robotics club, field hockey, debate, than they do uh, the kind of core classes. So here was one day in the same school. So this is me walking into an English class. Students are Googling, again, this is pretty well off school, which country has the highest voting rates? Turns out to be some country in Eastern Europe. Who knew? Uh, then four minutes on me. I'm a Harvard professor, Harvard, blah, 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 anything to do, not do whatever we're supposed to be doing, just like provide some entertainment. Uh, then uh, video clips from three versions of Hamlet, the Kenneth Branagh one, the Mel Gibson one, and one other. And then they were supposed to be doing some sort of discussion of the clips and how, they were per how he was portraying the character, but there was only about four minutes for that. And then there was uh, this matching game where they translated some of the Shakespearean English into modern English, and they were supposed to sort of order it in the same direction as the passages. And then there was homework and exit music. And it turned out this was actually a hip hop elective, but uh, all seniors had to read Hamlet. And so it was like Hamlet in a hip hop elective. Uh, and so uh, <laughs> in theory, they were supposed to be like emphasizing the identity elements of Hamlet and so on. Anyway, you could see what it was actually like. Anyway, so as I was leaving, this girl, Rose, uh, comes up to the teacher and she says, um, you know, um, Mr. G, I, uh, I'm not going to be able to do the reading for Thursday. And he says, why not? And she says, well, I'm the stage manager for Servant of Two Masters, and we have a show going up next week, and I'm going to be here until 11 o'clock every night, so I don't have time to read it. And he says, don't worry about it. You know what's important. Um, and so an hour later, I'm uh, sitting in rehearsal for this uh, show, and it's 3.30. Uh, people are putting on costumes. People are sitting in small groups, running lines with each other. Uh, they're socializing, bonding. You know, they haven't seen their friends all day. Uh, the Rose is there. She has a, you know, the stage manager's notebook. She's going through the plan for the day. She's, like, her demeanor is totally uh, different. Uh, the director gathers the troops, frames the day. He says, you know, forget your quizzes, your tests. Like, it was almost like uh, hypnosis, like leave behind where you were and like be present because you, and then like gradually move from you to your character, like re-envision yourself as your character. And then students lead a uh, physical uh, warm up. So they warm up their mouths, they warm up their bodies, they're trying to increase their energy. Uh, um, and then uh, there's rehearsal uh, and Students are rehearsing. The students who are rehearsing are on stage. They get stopped occasionally by the director for notes. The students who are not in particular scenes are sitting in the audience doing their homework on their phones, whatever. But when they're on stage, they're not doing their homework on their phones, et cetera. Um, OK. So uh, what's different about the two spaces? Um, so here are eight uh, elements. Uh, one, there's a purposeful arc towards public performance. Two, they chose to be there. Three, they're part of a community. Some of the students said they didn't even know the names of the students in their classes. 
uh, but that they definitely knew the names of the peoples in the show. And the reason that they knew that was they were dependent upon them, which brings us to this next point about interdependent roles. So if normal classes have one teacher and 30 students, this had students in every conceivable realm of leadership, one running the lights, one running the costumes, one running the set design, and then those were seniors, and then juniors who were assistants to all of those things, uh, which created a lot of opportunities for apprenticeship learning. Um, there were these spirals of uh, mastery, identity, and creativity, i.e. they were developing uh, knowledge about their roles. They were very invested in what they were doing. Over time, you know, sweatshirts with the show's name appeared, and that sort of marked them as having collective identity, which they started to wear around the school. Um, head, heart, and hands. This is an old Pestalozzi notion. So in most of school, it was just sort of students' brains on sticks. Like they were only using the cognitive part of their brain. In this, they were emotionally invested, trying to stretch who they were to become their uh, characters, and uh, that was quite uh, challenging, but also rewarding when they succeeded. And then finally, they were doing what my colleague uh, Dave Perkins calls uh, playing the whole game at the junior level. So Dave's idea is that when little kids learn to play baseball, they don't spend one year throwing and the next year catching and the year after that batting. Uh, what they do is they play baseball the way that six-year-olds can play baseball. And sure, you practice the elements to get better at them, but you do it in the context of the whole game. So my six-year-old plays chess, not well, but you know we can work on the specific pieces, but he at least understands the purpose of the overall thing that uh, he's doing. And school often compartmentalizes uh, the purpose of the overall enterprise from the specific uh, task. OK, uh, so to wrap up, uh, what might we do about this? Um, so uh, one agenda is a kind of within the box, uh, how could we uh, improve things? So if we didn't sort of change the fundamental grammar of schooling, how could we improve things? Uh, and I think it would look something like this. Uh, we would need higher standards for teachers, particularly with respect to content knowledge, because the content knowledge is the basis from which the rest of it flows. Uh, teacher training would need to uh, socialize and give experiences to people that showed them that teaching as transmission wasn't really what they were trying to do and showed them what a different mode of working would look like. Uh, external testing would have to shift from emphasizing uh, coverage to emphasizing depth. This is not undoable. International baccalaureate is one system of assessments that measures things uh, in, with more emphasis on depth than breadth. Uh, so for example, uh, rather than answering 100 questions about different things that happened in American history, you might write an essay on a topic of your choosing about uh, things in American history, and that essay might get evaluated on um, level of argumentation, use of supporting evidence, things like that. So you could change the, the sort of form of the external assessment. Um, uh, symmetry, uh, as I said, we came to think that you couldn't do this unless you'd experienced it. So we'd have to create these experiences for a lot of adults. Um, and we did see some examples of success beyond the individual teachers in schools. And these often happened where there was a sort of ongoing effort to build adult learning in the schools. Um, but um, I don't know. The theater experience in particular made me think that even a mediocre theater director was working in a much more favorable grammar than an average biology teacher. So sure, like the quality of the director and what they could see and the nature of their feedback made a huge difference in the quality of the final production. But a lot of the things that they needed, they didn't have to persuade parents that there was a you know, authentic performance to show up for. They had long blocks of time after school. The idea of students had seen shows in real life, so they knew what they were shooting for. Like they had a lot to work from. So, you know, what if we imagined, reimagined school and we changed the kind of grammar of schooling to follow the grammar of learning? And imagine that people got put into uh, sort of vertically, or people chose to become part of uh, vertically integrated communities of learning. So uh, take something like quantitative reasoning, you know, uh, everyone from my six-year-old who's asking, you know, why does this food hurt my stomach and not that food, and we're talking about correlation and causation, to my psychometric colleagues at the ed school, 
they're essentially engaged in a common task of quantitative reasoning about social uh, and, in this case, biological uh, events. But uh, in school, um, those opportunities are very sort of cut off from one another. So we could imagine a world where uh, you know, ninth through 12th graders enrolled in some sort of quantitative reasoning about the world class, and the ninth graders are doing bivariate correlations, and the 12th graders are doing regressions, and the ninth graders get to see. You know, they're all reading the newspaper and seeing whether the inferences that are drawn commonly really hold, which might be interesting to them, but uh, they're doing it at quite different levels of sophistication. Right now, the ninth grade students have no access to what the 12th grade students are doing, uh, and vice versa. Um, all right, so to conclude, uh, deeper learning is hard to achieve, but worth uh, striving for. Once you move from black and white to color, it's hard to go back. Just a question of how we could help people make that uh, transition. Thank you. Thank you.